Hello, it's Scott Manley here, back from my adventure on California's central coast to see the launch of Dart in person. And this was the live stream, which I did not see at the time because I was on Vandenberg Space Force Base watching it with my own eyes and, in theory, trying to take some pictures of it. In practice, that didn't work out so well because there was some big camera glass involved and some very, well, shaky old man hands. But if you pause the video at the right moment, you do get nice shots like this showing the booster emerging from the marine layer. DART was a big deal for me. This is the first mission you can say is a real planetary defense mission. And that's something that I've been advocating for for since at least the 1990s. So to be at the launch in person was pretty special. And even more so, I, I got to bring the whole family on this trip. We got great viewing positions. Spent a lot of time talking with some really cool people from Space Force, including some official representatives of the 18th Space Control Squadron. They of course run Spacetrack.org, which is a service I use all the time, and they've obviously had a, an interesting couple of weeks given the recent Russian anti-satellite test. At the media site, there was also an alien, and I've no idea what that was all about. I was of course there for a rocket launch, and I was really happy that the kids wanted to help me take photographs. Sky uh, insisted on shooting everything manually, which meant she kind of got caught by surprise and only got one good exposure of the whole lot. Orion had shaky hands as well, so I guess it's not an old man thing, but yeah, he used my little uh, Sony point and shoot and recorded some video and included this little atmospheric effect just around Ma Max Q when it hit the cloud layer. I thought that was pretty cool. But, you know, once we got late into the first stage flight, then it became a lot easier to keep the camera moving and tracking the target. And we got to see the engines bloom out. It, it, I think this is the best footage I got of the whole thing, to be honest. I mean, I, I think part of it is that the camera is no longer being blinded by the bright light against the dark background and actually has reasonable exposure for the few seconds before the engine shuts down for uh, staging. But I think this was the best photo I produced in the end. And I say produced because this wasn't originally a photo. Now, this does look like a long exposure photo that an actual competent photographer might have pulled off, although they would have probably consulted with Flight Club IO and pointed their camera correctly so that the top of the trajectory wasn't out of frame. But this was actually made using an iPhone. I just set my iPhone on a tripod, put it in wide angle mode and pointed it in roughly the right direction. Obviously, I should have pointed it a little higher. And from that, I produced a video which was, you know, about 10 minutes long. And then I ran that through a process to pick the brightest pixel in every single frame and create one image from it. And this is the image I got. I did look for software to do this originally, but in the end I just wrote some code very quickly to do it. How quickly? Well, the code fits into a single tweet. This is Python code that uses open computer vision and NumPy. It reads the file and picks out the, the pixels and generates the images. And yeah, after I posted that, some other people used it. This isn't a death ray from space. This is a rocket taking off. Similarly, this is the Inspiration4 launch as recorded by a GoPro and then you know, converted to a long exposure using this. And this is my recording of the SAOCOM launch, which was a 2018 launch in October. It was a twilight launch, so you got to see a lot of uh, high altitude visibility. This was recorded 230 miles away from Vandenberg, but the great thing is you get to see all the important steps in the launch here. Yeah, and you can actually make it out. If you adjust the contrast, you can actually see the reaction control thrusters from the fairings. Now, all those aircraft trails can detract from the image. And it turns out you can actually remove them just by masking those off in the particular frames where you see them. This is what you end up with. It, it works pretty well. Now, you know, there's a lot of stuff you can do there in terms of adjusting the curves. I think this is actually showing some uh, artifacts from the bear mask. But I don't know, I think this is a cool trick when you do it right. There is one amazing real-time lapse taken by Brian Sandoval from Shell Beach, which is north. And the main thing you want to see here is that it curves off to the left. It actually takes this dogleg turn. The rocket initially takes off and heads towards a bearing of 170 degrees. But after stage separation, the upper stage actually makes a hard turn because it really should be aiming for a bearing of about 150 degrees. 
that's the direction they need to go to get into their target orbit. But I think if they went directly into that, it would put the landing barge in this region, which I think is possibly um, Mexico's you know, territorial waters. I mean, it looks to me like the barge was actually placed about just over 100 kilometers off the coast of Guadalupe Island. And you know, the rocket could do this kind of thing because it was carrying a very small spacecraft. That is a 600 kilogram spacecraft on a rocket which frequently throws uh, payloads that are over 15 tons into orbit. And that meant that the second stage probably set an acceleration record for a Falcon 9 because it was pushing the smallest mass uh, and, you know, accelerating it to fuel depletion. If you, if you look at the velocity, the speed change here, at one point towards the end when it's almost out of fuel, it's pulling something like 7G. But, you know, next month there's going to be an even smaller payload of like 300 kilograms that's getting a dedicated Falcon 9. This is the Imaging X-ray Polarimetry Explorer. And this was originally designed to fly on the very small Pegasus launcher, which is carried on a plane because it has to go into an equatorial orbit with zero degree inclination. As it turns out, Pegasus was too expensive, or at least it was more expensive than SpaceX. To get to that zero degree orbit though, the stage is going to have to light up 20 minutes after launch and twist the plane of the orbit into the zero degree inclination. And that will mean some pretty high accelerations, I imagine, for that hardworking second stage. Anyway, speaking of hard working, I expect the 18th Space Control Squadron had a lot of work going on this week. Immediately after DART, there were something like three other launches in quick succession. Perhaps uh, most importantly, I think for, you know, the International Space Station at least, was the Progress spacecraft carrying the Preshell module, which is the, um, the final module for the current uh, expansion of the International Space Station on the Russian segment. The launch actually looked significantly different from your average Soyuz launch. I mean, obviously, it's a nighttime launch, so you get some glorious looks at these uh, engines. Soyuz only launches during the day. But the fairing at the top isn't the skinny one used for progress, it's the fat one usually used for satellites. And that's because the pre-shell docking module on the Progress makes it look kind of fat, so they needed to use the fat, uh, fat fairing. The Progress is largely there to deliver this module, which docked to the bottom of the recently arrived Nauka module. Now, it has a number of docking ports on, it's basically a spherical module with a number of docking options, but there aren't a great many things planned other than more Progress and Soyuz visits. The science and power module was at one point planned to dock to this, but it sounds like that's now going to be the core of a new Russian station. So these things obviously always have a lot of politics going on around them. But yeah, as of right now, there's no plans to dock anything other than spacecraft to it. No modules. It was only hours later when Russia also launched Cosmos 2552 from the Placets Cosmodrome. This is believed to be a missile early warning satellite. It's in a highly eccentric 12 hour orbit in a 63.4 degree orbit. So it goes up to very high altitude and loiters there and comes back down once every 12 hours. And that puts its apogee over Russia and over the US. And China launched the Xi'an 11 satellite on board a Kwaizu 1A rocket, which is a, a different from most other Chinese rockets. It's all solid. And if you look at the nose, you can see that there's steering thrusters that fire to keep their vehicle uh, you know, pointed the right direction. That's an interesting design. I don't see that very often. There was also a bit of a scare this week with the James Webb Space Telescope. While they were preparing to mate it to the rocket, apparently a clamp released unexpectedly and that drove a shock or vibration through the structure. So they've had to go back and verify that everything is correctly configured and that nothing has been damaged. The launch date has now been pushed back to December 22nd, which is getting pretty close to Christmas. And I know that you might be concerned that the James Webb Space Telescope could hit Santa on liftoff, but I'm going to say, don't worry. James Webb Space Telescope launching on time is just a story that we tell children. But seriously, I, I hope everything's fine with it. You know, it's obviously a very sensitive piece of hardware. And yeah, if you drop it, you can't just invoke the five second rule. 
And over at Blue Origin's suborbital spaceflight program, uh, they announced six new passengers for the next flight, including a TV anchor, uh, a parent and a child combination, which is a first, and uh, Laura Shepard Churchley, who's the eldest daughter of Alan Shepard, for which New Shepard is named. So yeah, I still get the feeling that the PR department at Blue Origin are uh, picking some of these passengers. Finally, the cool people over at Rocket Lab have uh, recovered the booster from their last flight, Love at First Insight, and uh, everything is looking good. So good that they are apparently committing to attempt an actual aerial recovery. We never really got any video from the helicopter during the um, during the live stream, but apparently they were close enough that they feel that for future flights that they will actually try to recover it. You know, while the booster is falling under the parachute, the helicopter will attempt to capture. The helicopter will have larger fuel tanks because once it captures the rocket, they actually want to fly it all the way back to land rather than dropping it on a ship. And to help keep the booster in good shape, they're now going to be applying a new heat shield material to it. So previously the Electron was made of carbon fiber. It was black. It would have red segments for the reusable ones, but now it's red and silver. I am really curious to see what that looks like after it falls through the atmosphere at hypersonic velocities. So yeah, that's my roundup of my, well, very interesting week. Don't get to go and see rocket launches all the time. I don't know, I'm sort of thinking that I should actually have a, a regular news slot where I just run over all the various launches and other interesting news. There's just always too much to cover in the level of detail that I like. Speaking of which, it's time to get back to working on the regular videos. I'm Scott Manley. Fly safe. Fly safe.